here. Okay, good morning or afternoon, I guess. This could be anybody anywhere at some point in the future. Uh, I 11 310 303 CA Chemical Calculations Part A. So, delving into some uh, math, lots of math actually. So, let's see what we're up to today. Objectives are to describe molar mass, mass, number of molecules, number of atoms for a given number of moles of any compound. Well, that sounds intimidating, doesn't it? Then we are going to calculate the volume for a given number of moles of any gas at standard conditions. Not so bad once you know what some of these other things are. And then last, we are going to calculate the percent mass composition of each element in a compound. And this is some math uh, that you'll do in other subjects uh, in the future uh, related to measurement. Um, so good math to know. So most of this ILM is math. Why do we need to do this? By being able to do mass or molar calculations, you'll be able to calculate gas densities, compound compositions, and understand how to make calibration standards. That's the theory. So the pivot point for today is the periodic table of elephants, uh, particularly this one that has the atomic mass uh, numbers on them. These are the numbers that one mole of this element weighs. And forgive my terminology, I'm putting it into layman's terms here, but all of these numbers here are the molar mass for one mole of that particular substance. So these are the numbers that we're going to be uh, using today. So the basis of our calculations is molar mass, as I showed you on the uh, previous slide here. Uh, this is a relationship between the mass and the number of atoms or molecules in this next um, little thing that's a little bit more confusing than it needs to but the long story short and we've mentioned this in a previous lecture is that all of these masses are relative to the carbon 12 isotope they basically broke it into 12 pieces and that's the unit of mass that they use and the long story short is by the time we get through the next five slides um it's going to be a gram so don't panic when we go through this stuff because it can be a little bit complicating uh, as you read through it here. Okay, so molar mass, relationship between mass and the number of atoms or molecules, and we talked about uh, how much a proton weighs and how much a neutron weighs and how much an electron weighs in relative proportion to each other, and it was like 1,835 uh, to 1,836 to 1 or something like that. I don't remember the exact numbers either. Um, but we're talking about those, those masses and how they, they uh, are derived. So if substance's mass is simply its quantity of matter, and molar mass is the mass of one mole of a compound or element. And it's based on two basic concepts. Uh, and we're really, this confuses it more than it needs to, but it's based on two basic concepts, moles and then formula or molar mass. And when we have these two things, we can calculate molar mass, but ultimately molar mass is just given to us on a periodic table. So moles, uh, just like a dozen is 12, and the sleeve of golf balls is three, a mole is a specific number of things. So don't be overwhelmed by the fact that it's a ginormous number. Uh, the mole, uh, one mole of any substance, mathematically is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd of that substance is particles. So imagine 6.022 and then 23 zeros after it. Uh, it's a really, really big, big number. But that's uh, this is the number right here that we need to worry about. It's very important for what we're doing today. And we have to remember this number and it's got a special name. Some of you may remember this name, Avogadro's number. So Avogadro is the basis of molar calculations that we're doing today. So Avogadro's number here, here's a little clip here, is the number of particles in a mole that is the relative atomic mass or molecular mass scaled up into grams. And we're going to be doing it all in grams, but this little section is just explaining how, how did we get from uh, this carbon 12 
uh, to grams. And the carbon 12 relationship is the fact that it happens to have uh, 12 protons and neutrons put together. That's how it gets its atomic number. And oddly enough, it's also 12 grams. So they say each one of them is basically a gram. And that's long story short. So um, looking at different elements and different mole sizes, this bowl contains one mole of hydrated copper sulfate. This bowl contains uh, one mole of, of zinc. And if we were to look at the periodic table of elements, for example, uh, element number 30, which is zinc, uh, you'll see on the periodic table has an atomic mass uh, that they state at 65.38 grams. And you can call it what you want to call it, but for our purposes, grams is, uh, is what we're most interested in. Hydrated copper sulfate is a little different because this is a compound, so we'd have to find out the masses of each individual component in the compound and the ratios of the components in that compound, and that's really what we're going to be doing today. So before we get to that, let's just quickly uh, do a little bit more uh, in-depth analysis of what this carbon-12 is and where they ended up getting this number from. So atomic mass unit is what they base everything in the periodic table in basically uh, in chemistry terms. And it's equal to 1 12th the mass of one carbon 12 atom. So if we took a carbon 12 atom and we looked at the periodic table, you would see that it's got an atomic mass of 12 grams, which means that 1 12th of it is about a gram. And that's how we end up doing that conversion. Elements found naturally are a mixture of their isotopes. We, we learned that there was carbon-12, carbon-13, carbon-14, and there was many other isotopes for all the other elements as well. Uh, their mass is weighted to represent the average of these isotopes, and then that weighted average is what we see on the periodic table, and it re represents its mass uh, in these atomic mass units. Moles uh, allow us to quickly convert from these atomic mass units to grams of the substance. And this really again is a little bit more confusing than it needs to be uh because as we move forward basically we're using the periodic table and the numbers and we're referring to them as grams okay so how much is a mole in grams so a mole in grams again is exactly what it says on the periodic table for any signal element for example uh, if you looked at your periodic table uh for helium which is way over on the top right you'll see that it's atomic mass or amu is down here and it's 4.03 sulfur on the periodic table if you found that it's a little bit down from helium and to the left you'll see 32.068 or 32.07 um, rounded up iron same thing periodic table element number 26 55.85 so these are the masses for one mole of an individual element straight off the periodic table when we get to something uh, like sodium chloride over here, or this potassium chromate, uh, or sugar over here, we have obviously different things going on. Um, a mole of sodium chloride, for example, is going to be made up of the ratio of uh, uh, ingredients, I guess, in the recipe, right? So one part sodium and one part chlorine, which means that we have to have one part sodium, which weighs 22.99 and one part chlorine, which I don't have listed here, but it's 35.45. Uh, 35 we add them two, two together, and that is the mass of one mole of sodium chloride. Doing something more complicated like this, again, this is the, uh, this is the recipe, and these are all the individual ratios of ingredients in that one recipe. So two parts of K, two parts of CR, and seven parts of oxygen. So you'll have to do the math associated with these uh, ratios. So uh, you'll have to find K, which is 39.09, uh, multiply that by two. You'll have to find chromium, uh, which is 51.996, and you'll have to have two of them. And you'll have to find oxygen, which is 16, and there'll be seven of them. So you'll have to do that multiplication and then add them all up. And that is the mass of one mole of that particular compound. So that's really what we're gonna be doing uh, today in terms of math. So formula mass and molecular mass, what's this relationship? We said that it's basically one to one, so we don't really have to worry about it. And the formula mass uh, and molecular 
mass again have to do to, with these ratios. So chemical formulas provide us with lots of information. We are concerned with the compounds they contain and the relative amounts of each for those ratios. In order to do this as easy as possible, just as a reminder here, we always reduce to the lowest ratio. So if I had uh, O2H2, of course, I would uh, lower it down to the lowest common denominator, which would be one, and we would write it as OH, just as a refresher to you. Uh, we've learned about ionic and covalent compounds, so we'll talk about that really quickly, although it doesn't make a big difference in our lives. Okay, ionic compounds, uh, just some characteristics here. They form crystals of a repeating pattern. And the formula for an ionic compound expresses the ratio of cations and anions in the crystal. Uh, so again, sodium chloride, one sodium, one chloride. So the ratio is one to one. If we're doing the formula mass, because this is two elements now, so it's a, it's a formula or a recipe, um, we have to know the masses of each individual one or the ratios of them and the masses of each, which we get off the periodic table. So pretty straightforward, one sodium, 22.99, one chlorine, 35.45. The formula, ma our formula mass of this formula is 58.44. And we'll write it here in AMUs for a second, but we're gonna get away from this relatively quickly and, and uh, generally be writing this as grams and you'll find out why in a second. Okay, so that was not too, not too tricky. And now we'll look at molecular mass. So a little differentiation here, but not really significant in all in our lives but it is for if you're a chemist it would matter uh, each molecule in a covalent compound has a molecular mass molecular mass is the sum of the atomic masses of each atom in the molecular formula and is measured in amus so nothing really different here except that this is now two uh, non-metals instead of a metal and a non-metal we still have a, a ratio uh, and we still have a formula or a recipe because we're combining two things here hydrogen and oxygen and the ratio of this is uh, not given in this particular image, but we know that water is H2O, which tells us that we have uh, two hydrogens and one oxygen. So doing, doing the math for the molar mass or molecular mass is the same as it is for the previous slide. We count the ratio. So we have one oxygen, which is 16 grams per mole. We have two hydrogens. So one hydrogen is 1.01. The other hydrogen is also 1.01. We add them all together, and the molecular mass of one molecule of water is 18 point whatever it happens to be, more or less rounded up here in this situation. So nothing, uh, nothing too crazy there. So what does all of this mean? Why are we even bothering to differentiate between uh, molecular mass and ionics and formula units? Is there any reason we're doing this? And my simple answer is not really um, for calculation purposes formula mass and molecular mass are identical the difference between the two terms is that ionic compounds are not made up of molecules technically and therefore by definition do not have a molecular mass that's what it all comes down to chemistry people are weird uh, what can i say okay so again just to make sure that we understand exactly what happened here the ionic version we're simply adding the ratio of the elements together, one to one in this case, and getting a number. Same thing with the molecular. We're just adding them together and getting a number. So nothing really different whatsoever. Okay, so now we're gonna get into molar mass and something a little bit more complicated. Here's a compound. Uh, and again, this is like saying I'm making a batch of cookies. This is the name of my cookies, magnesium phosphate cookies. And in order to make these magnesium phosphate cookies, to make one batch of them, which I'm looking at here, I need three parts of magnesium and then two parts of whatever this is. And in this case, it's uh, phosphorus and oxygen. So two times each of those, so two Ps, and two times these four oxygens. So overall, I'm gonna need eight oxygens and here's what it looks like. So uh, three moles of magnesium. Each mole weighs 24.31 grams. Two moles of phosphorus. Each mole weighs 30.97 grams. And eight moles of oxygen. Each of those weighs 16 grams. And we add them all together as we see here. And this one recipe 
or one mole of this magnesium phosphate recipe is 262.87 grams. So that's a long windy road probably to get to something that hopefully you're going to look at right now and go, oh, this isn't so bad. Uh, I hope that's what you feel. Um, it gets a little bit trickier than this, but not really much trickier than this. Okay, page 11 talks about uh, something called stoichiometry. Uh, and this is a word that you'll hear uh, a few times this year. Uh, and stoichiometry is the calculation of the chemical reactions, reactant or product mass. Sounds impressive. Stoichiomic, uh, stoichiometric calculations uh, may require the conversion of mass to moles, moles to mass, or moles of one substance to moles of a different substance. So uh, very impressive, very impressive uh, sounding here, the calculation of chemical reactions, reactant or product mass. And basically stoichiometry is just basically saying, uh, we're doing the math to ensure that we get the correct ratios of our reactants on the left-hand side and our products on the right-hand side uh, we're getting the right ratios in order to make our product, and that's the mathematical calculations that we do. So if you, uh, you know, were going to be a chemist and you wanted to know how to make something, uh, if you had the chemical formula for it, you could, in theory, using the periodic table, uh, determine how many grams of each uh, material that you need to go to the pharmacy to buy in order to make whatever, whatever thing that you, that you want to be making. So uh, we're going to be doing some uh, basic stoichiometry uh, is a long story short. Okay, and uh, the, most of the rest of this I-11, at least uh, the math that is required to do mass to mole conversions, mole to mass conversions, and then converting um, between moles of different substances. And it sounds tricky, uh, but it's really not that tricky. Okay, so here's how we are going to do it. So we're going to take mass and convert it to moles, or we're going to take a given number of moles and convert it to mass. Remember what we're looking at on the periodic table, the numbers on the periodic tables, that is the mass for one mole of that particular element. So keep that in your head. I personally uh, am not a big fan of the way the ILM uh, lays out their math here. I find it more confusing than, than not, but there are some handy tricks that I'll, uh, that I'll show you as we go through here. So what does this conversion process look like, mass to moles? So uh, the best way to figure this out and what we're trying to do is to actually do it. So let's have a look at an example here. Uh, convert, convert 24 grams of oxygen gas, and that's important because the oxygen molecule is one oxygen, but oxygen gas is actually O2 or two molecules. We have to be aware of that. Convert 24 grams of oxygen gas to moles. We look at our periodic table for oxygen, and we'll see that oxygen is about 16 grams per mole. Okay. There's two of them in uh, a mole of oxygen gas. So two times 16 means that we have 32 AMUs or 32 grams per mole. And I promise that we're going to stop using AMUs pretty soon. Uh, oxygen is 32 grams per mole as, as a fact. So we have 24 grams of it. It's 32 grams to make a mole. This is a simple ratio. We have 24 grams out of 32 that it takes to make one mole. It tells us we have enough to make three quarters of a mole. So 0.75 moles of oxygen gas. So I don't know. To me, the words make it more complicated than, than it is. It's basically, uh, what do you have? What does it need to be? And that's all you're doing is basic conversions there. Hot tip. Um, usually, the first thing mentioned in the question is going to end up in the top of your formula, but we'll talk about that more as we go forward. Okay, doing a conversion the other way around, you have someone says, well, here's, here's a 0 0.261 moles of oxygen gas, O2, I want to know how many grams that is. Well, we know that one gram or one mole of oxygen gas is 32 grams. So if I multiply 32 grams times 0.261 moles, I get 8.352 grams of oxygen gas. 
It's just saying I have a little more than a quarter of a mole. One mole is 32 grams, so I should have a little more than eight. So well, hopefully you don't find that too bad. Uh, as we move through the ILM, you'll see at the end of each one of these little uh, segments, there's a little chart like this that says, uh, if you have mass and you want to get moles, what do, you, what do I have to do? So if I have the mass and I need to get moles, I'm going to divide the mass by the molar mass. If I have the moles and I want to find the mass, I'm going to multiply by the molar mass. So not, uh, hopefully not too uh, confusing. Okay, uh, particulars in doing the math, uh, maybe, maybe, less, maybe less important than I'm making it out to be, but uh, if you're a chemist, it's going to be very important. Uh, in my class, not quite as important, uh, but significant digits. So 1.23 grams, for example, is three significant digits. So long story short, you're basically going to want your answer to be in the same uh, number of significant digits. And if you have a question that has a whole bunch of different uh, numbers in it, you're going to want to use uh, the, the number that's most uh, precise. And actually, this is, what does it say, based on the Bering equation with the fewest significant digits. I don't necessarily buy that. Let's just disregard this. Let's just disregard this question. Typically, what I do uh, in, in the calculations at least when I generate answers for the math calculations. Uh, whatever number has the most number of decimal places, I tend to make the answer in the same number of decimal places. So three significant digits, three significant digits, that kind of thing. Probably made that more confusing than it need to be. OK, um, here's some examples from the ILM. A uh, little bit more complicated examples just to make sure that uh, we understand the concepts here. We're really, again, only doing a couple of different things, going from mass to moles or moles to mass. So question says, convert 0.126 moles of sodium phosphate into grams. So in order to do that, I have to know a couple of things. Uh, first one is how much do I, I have? I have 0.126 moles of this compound. And then I need to know how much does this compound weigh? in one mole. How much is one mole of this? Because I don't have a whole mole of it. I've only got a fraction of it, about an eighth of it. So we have to calculate that. So pretty straightforward process uh, using the formula units here, three sodiums, one phosphorus, four oxygens. We, we do the multiplication here. So three times sodium, one times phosphorus, four times oxygen, add them all together, 163.94 grams per mole. So one recipe of this compound would weigh this much. If I had a whole recipe of it, but I don't, I only have this much of a recipe of it. So I'm looking for 0.126 of that amount or about an eighth of that amount, which happens to be about 20.7 grams. So a couple of steps to get there. Um, and as we move through the ILM, basically what we're going to be doing is compounding these steps. Um, so if you don't get the first ones, uh, it does tend to make the later ones a little bit more complicated. Okay, second example here, let's convert 101 grams of calcium carbonate into moles. So we know, uh, we, know we have this much of it. Um, I guess we need to know next what is, a, what is a mole of this, what is this mole of this stuff weigh so that we can find out the ratio to what we have to, to what it is. So again, we have to do uh, the recipe conversion here. So one calcium, one carbon, three oxygens, one times calcium, one times carbon, three times oxygen. Uh, add them together. It turns out to be 100.09 grams per mole. So one unit of this would weigh this much. We have 101 grams, which is slightly more than this. So uh, without using the calculator, I'm going to say I'm going to have at least one mole. Uh, dividing that into each other. 101 grams uh, is what we have, 100.09 is what a mole weighs, and we have 1.009 moles. Now, uh, as an example for this one here, uh, I would have just rounded this up to 1.01, uh, and that's what I'm getting at here with why is this answer wrong. Way too many numbers. Any questions at this point here? Are you guys still hanging on for this ride? Everything okay?
Yeah. Perfect. All right. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm doing lots of examples here in the, in the presentation just to try to um, make this easier for those who are uh, doing this on their own. So I'm trying to do a, a few examples here. Okay, next one here is convert 0.178 moles of aluminum into grams. So finding the molar mass of aluminum, this one is straightforward, only one element going on the periodic table. It is 26.98 grams per mole. I have 0.178 or 17% uh, of this. We do the multiplication, 0.178 times 26.98 tells us that we have 4.8 grams in 0.178 moles. So again, hopefully not uh, too confusing for you. It does get worse. Uh, going back the other way again, we have 48 grams of oxygen. How many moles of oxygen do I have? One mole of oxygen gas contains two molecules of oxygen at 16 grams each. So we multiply two times 16, we get 32 grams per mole of oxygen gas. We have 48 grams of it, which means that we have more than one mole. Let's do the math. 48 divided by 32 tells us that we have 1.5 moles of oxygen gas if we have 48 grams of it. So um, hammering at home, hopefully hopefully you're following along with that. Uh, next uh, is mole to mole conversion. So we did moles to mass, mass to moles. Let's look at moles to moles. We've already been shown how the chemical formula can be used to determine the mole ratio uh, using these numbers down here. Uh, this is how many moles of each element are in one mole of the compound. So there's no numbers in front here. It's just one mole of this compound. So again, reinforcing what we've already said, this formula tells us that we have three moles of sodium, one mole of phosphorus, and four moles of oxygen. So uh, what can we make with what we have? This is kind of a more real life scenario. Uh, you've been asked to make up some kind of a calibration solution for something uh, based on a standard that you have uh, in inventory somewhere. Uh, how, how do you know how much, how much you can make with something? Or uh, you're at home in the kitchen and you want to make chocolate chip cookies. Um, and uh, if you're like me, you use the recipe on the back of the bag and it calls for two cups of chocolate chip cookies. Uh, but you only have a cup and a half of chocolate, chocolate chip cookies left in the bag. So how do you know how much of the other stuff to put in the, in the recipe in order to be able to use the rest of your cup and a half uh, chocolate chip cookies? Because it's not really a whole recipe. And that's what we're going to be doing here uh, next. And again, uh, or if you haven't figured it out, it's just going to be uh, ratios based on the formula units in the formula. So to figure out how many moles of sodium there are in 1.3 moles of sodium phosphate, all we have to do is multiply the number of moles by the mole ratio of sodium. It sounds complicated, but it's not tricky. It's a ratio. So again, no number in front here tells us that this is one, uh, one unit or one uh, batch of our, our recipe. Within our batch of the recipe, there's three moles of sodium one mole of phosphorus and four moles of oxygen. So this is what it's telling us. So there's a three to one ratio and that's what this represents here as well. Um, moving forward, uh, saying that most often, uh, if you like the way that the ILM lays this out, and I don't really like the way the ILM lays this out, I tend to do it in my head. Uh, but when you're reading the question, figure out how many moles of Na there are in 1.3 moles of this. 99.999% of the time, the first element mentioned in the question, whether it's this one or this one, whichever is first, is generally going to be the one on top of your little ratio calculation in the ILM, uh, in the ILM representation. I don't like doing it that way, but whatever it doesn't uh, it doesn't really matter so in this particular question uh it's telling me that i have 1.3 moles of this stuff so there is now a number in front of this of 1.3 so if i have 1.3 of these well i just have three times 
right? Or one times 1.3 or four times 1.3 in order to get the number of moles of that particular thing. So in this question, because the ratio here is that there's three of these in one of these, well, if there's, there's gonna be uh, three times this number in that many moles of it. So it's, it sounds worse than it is. So three times 1.3 is 3.9 moles. That's the long story short. Probably made that a little bit more painful than it needed to be. Okay, we'll look at a different example here to figure out how many moles of Na3PO4 that we can uh, that we can make if we have 7.8 moles of oxygen. We have to divide the moles of oxygen available by the mole ratio of oxygen in that recipe. So there are four moles of oxygen in one mole of this, right? I have almost eight moles. I have 7.8 moles. I have almost eight moles of oxygen. So I should get nearly two moles of this compound. And you can go through this in your head kind of quickly to get you, you know, to make sure that you know you're on the right track. Keep it simple, stupid is kind of, kind of what I said there. Uh, but again, using our ratio, uh, we have 7.8 moles of oxygen. Um, in one mole of sodium phosphate, there are four moles of oxygen. Do the math, 7.8 times 0.25, which is what this works out to, says that we can make 1.95 moles of this recipe if I have this much oxygen on the shelf. Hopefully that's not uh, super duper confusing. Uh, it can be a little bit overwhelming when you first do it, but again, uh, practice makes perfect. Call your attention again to looking at the question, how many moles of Na3PO4? First thing in the question, on top of this division equation again. So you'll see that. First thing in the question is on the top. It's, I'm not going to tell you that's 100% fail safe, but it is pretty close to fail safe. Um, if, if you're having uh, a tough time wrapping your head around the verbal uh, explanation of what's going on here, uh, that's a handy way to kind of keep it in your head uh, visually. Okay, to recap again here, so we're going from uh, moles of a particular atom uh, within a compound or moles of a compound and finding out how many atoms are in it. So if we have the moles of atoms and we want to know the moles of a compound, we divide by the mole ratio. If we have moles of a compound and we want to find the moles uh, of a particular atom, we divide by that mole ratio. And again, it's all just based off the formula and the units in the formula. Okay, let's look at some more examples here. Find the number of moles of potassium in 0.21 moles of potassium sulfate. So what's the mole ratio here when we're dealing with potassium? We have two potassiums, two potassiums in one mole of this. So our ratio is two to one. And again, potassium is mentioned here first. And oddly enough, it's on top of the formula. So we'll multiply that out, we get two times 0.261 or 0.522 moles of potassium. Okay, it's simply we have we have 0.26 moles of this compound. So I'm gonna have 0.26 times this. 0.26 times this, 0.26 times this, if I were going to break them all out in individually. The easiest way to remember this is one mole, one mole of this contains this ratio. So working upwards or downwards from a whole number, you can almost do it mentally to get you kind of close. Example number two, find how many moles of sodium phosphate you can form with one and a half moles of sodium. So looking at the formula here, I know that to make one of these, I need three sodiums. I only have one and a half sodiums. So obviously I can only make half a recipe. No math done yet at all, but let's see how it looks. The mole ratio of sodium phosphate, one mole of sodium phosphate contains three moles of sodium. That's 0.33. Multiply that by the 1.5 moles of sodium that we have, and lo and behold, 0.5 moles of sodium phosphate is what we can make. So, again, don't let 
this become over complicated. A couple more examples just to make sure we're on track here. Find the number of moles of oxygen in 1.2 moles of oxygen gas. Well, we know that one mole of oxygen gas contains two moles of oxygen. So if I have 1.2 moles of it, I'm going to have two times 1.2. Two times 1.2 is 2.4 moles of oxygen. The more you do of this, uh, the easier it should, uh, should come to you. Okay, find out how many moles of C2H6O you can form from 12.6 moles of H. Well, let's just think about this for a second. One recipe of this takes six H's. I have 12 H's, so I should be able to make two and a bit. Let's see. The mole ratio, one mole of C2H6O contains six moles of hydrogen, so that's 0.166 times what I've got in my hand, 12.6, tells me that I can get 2.10 moles of this recipe based on the ingredients I have on my shelf. So, um, you know, if you if you run through it kind of logically, it's, it's, it gets you pointed in the right direction. All right, here it gets a little bit more exciting yet. I uh, hope you didn't think that Avogadro was gone forever. Uh, we use his numbers to calculate the number of formula units, atoms, ions, and molecules in a given, given number of moles of a substance. Um, hooray, hooray. Uh, formula unit, again, is the smallest particle of an ionic compound, just as the molecule is the smallest part of a covalent compound, to reiterate what we said before. Uh, and remember, Avogadro said that there are 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms in one mole or units in one mole. This number uh, we're going to be using 6.02 uh, usually is adequate enough. Uh, feel free to use 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. That's fine. Uh, but we're going to be doing a bunch of math with this number now. Okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to be taking uh, a given number of moles, and then you're going to tell me how many molecules or atoms are in that number of moles or I'm going to give you a certain number of uh, atoms or, or molecules. This is where it gets kind of gray uh, units, uh, and we're going to convert them into moles, and it's all based on this 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd number. So if I have moles, one mole is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, regardless of what element it is. So if I had two moles, it would be two times this. 2 times 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd will be 12.04 times 10 to the 23rd molecules in two moles. So that's what we're going to be doing in the next uh, number of examples here. The uh, process itself isn't complicated. The numbers make it a little bit nastier than it needs to be. And again, those ratios are, are in play as well. So let's look at an example. Calculate the number of formula units and you'll hear it called a bunch of different things, in 1.3 moles of sodium, sodium chloride. So first, we're going to take the number of moles and multiply it by Avogadro's number. So 1.3 times 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd gives us this number here. Uh, pause for a quick second, and hopefully you have a calculator handy and you can run it out. I'll just do it here just to make sure that I get the right button pressing, but I believe you can go 1.3 times 6.02 exponent button 23 equals, and I get an answer of 7.826 times 10 to the 23rd. So close enough for me, uh, if you're punching it in your calculator, 1.3 times 6.02 exponent button number 23 equals and that should give you an answer okay going uh the other way how many moles of potassium are there if i have 1.29 times 10 to the 24 atoms a couple of things again looking at this logically before i rip out my calculator and start doing things what number is bigger one mole is 6.02 with 23 zeros. 
this is 1.29 with 24 zeros, which means that by nature, this is 10 times bigger than this one here. So you, you can write it right away saying that I'm going to have more than one because this is a much bigger number than this. Let's see if that's true. Divide the atoms given by Avogadro's number. So we have uh, 1.29 times 10 to the 24. Uh, Avogadro is 6.22 times 10 to 23. We divide that, uh, divide that together and we get 0 0.241 times 10 to the 1, or if we want to move our decimal place over there to make life easy, uh, 2.14 moles of potassium is what we have if we have this many atoms. So yeah, this is just the way it goes. Okay, uh, just to walk you through the process again here, and I, I labeled this slide specifically the process just because uh, again, the steps kind of build on each other and you could be, and you will be asked to do a conversion from one end all the way to the other end. So uh, you have to know this kind of inside, outside, upside down if you're a Dr. Zeus fan. Okay, calculate the number of molecules in 12 grams of carbon dioxide gas. So this is getting a little bit more complicated. Um, always start out looking at what information you have and what information you don't have. So I have some grams here. Uh, I have a formula, but I don't have anything else to go with it. So the first thing I'll automatically do is let's figure out how much this weighs. If I know how much this weighs and I compare it to how much I have, well, then I can find out how the number of moles that I've got, right? So from the number of moles, then I can multiply that by Avogadro's number to get the number of molecules. So it's a multi-step process. So the first thing I'm going to do is convert uh, to, from grams to moles. So in this formula, I have one carbon and two oxygens. Uh, carbon is 12.01, oxygens are 16, and there's two of them. So that's 32 plus 12 is 44.01 grams per mole for this compound. I have 12 grams of it. So 12 out of 44 tells me that I have 0 0.237 moles. Step one complete. Now I have to find out how many molecules I get. Well, I can get molecules uh, if I have moles. I do 0.273 times Avogadro's number. It'll tell me that I have 1.64 times 10 to the 23 atoms or molecules or units, whatever you feel like putting in there, particles, uh, if I have 12 grams. So multi step process. Uh, again, takes a little bit of uh, practice, but just apply the steps. If you take your given information, automatically go for the clue that's usually dropped here. What can I, what can I learn from this? I can, I can do a couple of things, right? I can find out what the atomic mass of this formula is, and then I can do something with that. So you gotta be able to work your way through the steps. Okay, calculator wise here in red, just to make sure that we're aware the calculator buttons work good. 0.273, uh, open, uh, open bracket, 6.02 exponent 23, close bracket, also works on the calculator. All right, another question here. Let's pound this in as hard as we can. Calculate the mass of oxygen atoms in 2.7 grams of calcium carbonate. So again, what do we know? We've got some number of grams and we've got some kind of a formula. So let's figure out how much this weighs. This is one mole, so let's figure out how much it weighs. So converting grams to moles. Uh, wow, I did a quick cheat here. Uh, one mole of calcium carbonate weighs 100.09 grams. I didn't show the steps to get there, but one calcium, one carbon, three oxygens, add them together equals 100.09. I have 2.75 grams. So the division there that tells me that I have 0 0.027 more, uh, 0 0.274 moles. Now I can convert moles to moles using our mole ratio. So again, um, one mole of this has three moles of oxygen in it. So again, oxygen is mentioned first. Lo and behold, it shows up on top of the uh, division portion again. So 0 0.2 zero, oh, sorry, 0 0.0274 times three over one equals 0 0.08242 moles of oxygen. 
that's that step completed. That's how many moles of oxygen are in there. Now we can convert from moles of oxygen into the molar mass. Lots of steps, I understand, but again, practice will be perfect. So we take our moles of oxygen times our molar mass of oxygen. So molar mass of oxygen is 16.08242 times 16 is 1.3188 grams of oxygen atoms. So that is uh, how many oxygen atoms or what the mass of oxygen atoms is in proportion to the 2.7 grams of this recipe. So long drawn out can be confusing. Um, many steps there as we see. Always start with uh, what you have and calculations that are easiest to figure out from there and basically you'll uh, once you get a couple pieces of information you'll be able to get all the other pieces of information. When in doubt, refer to this handy dandy sheet here that has all the different conversions that we've done up to now. So uh, if they're asking you for something, here's what I've got, here's what I need. Follow the steps as by the massive uh, chart here. Uh, Through this in here for your electricians. Uh, I know I kind of like this one myself. Uh, this isn't in the ILM, but this is another kind of easy way to uh, to do our conversions uh, if you don't like looking at this thing here. Okay, next slide here, a couple more examples uh, just pinched out of the ILM just to make sure that we're all uh, happy with the process here. Calculate the number of grams of sodium in 2.4 times 10 to the 25 atoms of sodium. So right off the bat, I see that it's 10 to the 25, which means that it's two decimal places bigger than Avogadro's number, which means I have more than one mole for sure, but we'll figure that out in a second. So um, doing the calculation here, we have this many atoms. We have to divide that by 6.022 in order to get a number of moles. Once we get the number of moles, we multiply that by 22.99 because that's what sodium weighs, and that will give us the answer here. This is from the ILM, so I, I'm kind of doing the quick, dirty version of it um, because the step-by-step -step is in the ILM. Um, but that's what's going on. We're taking we're taking what we know, uh, and we're we're doing the conversions that come most naturally here. So if it's giving you atoms, chances are you're going to be doing your first calculation uh, using Avogadro's number. Next one here, calculate the number of atoms of sulfur in 32.4 grams. So here we're starting with grams. So we're probably going to want to start out uh, figuring out the grams. So the sulfur for this example, convert 34.2 grams of this compound into moles of compounds, and then the moles of sulfur, and then to atoms of sulfur. So uh, the words are more confusing than the math, in my personal opinion. So let's figure out what we don't have. We don't have the mass of this, so we can figure out the mass of this, then we can use this to figure out how many moles we've got, right? So we take this, that tells us that one mole of this compound weighs this much, we have this much of it, so that tells me that we've got uh, 34 out of 207. I, don't, I didn't do the math here, but this is the way it works. I do it in my brain, rather than doing this long uh, string uh that they do in the ilm i don't tend to do it that way so if i were to do this i would do uh 34.2 divided by 207.91 equals 0.164 moles and then i know that i have um three of these in every one so i can do times three will get me 0.49 something 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 uh, and then I have to multiply that by Avogadro's number. Then that gives me 2.97 times 10 to the 23. So I do it differently. Um, if this works for you, great. Um, but again, um, more what I'm focusing on here is the fact that you got to do you got to do the number of steps. It doesn't matter what order you do them in necessarily. You'll still end up uh, you'll still end up over here. Um, but you'll have to do the steps. So you know, it's painful, but we got to do it. Okay, a couple more examples. How many grams of magnesium are in this many 
uh, atoms. Okay, looking at the number three times ten to the twenty-three. Well, gee, that automatically says I got pretty close to half of a mole already. But let's just go forward and see what happens. Convert the number of atoms to moles and then to grams. So I take my three divided by Avogadro's number, uh, and that's going to tell me that I have some some number over uh, some number of. Oh, sorry, uh, I have three. Uh, and that is six, so I have about half a mole. My math is bad. Half a mole, 0.5 times 24, gives us about 12.1 grams. So um, however you like to do it, um, just a matter of doing the steps and trying to keep it simple. How many grams of CH4 or methane are there in 1.2 times 10 to, the 10 to the 21 molecules? This is a smaller number than Avogadro, so it's a fraction of a mole. Uh, again, same with this one. Uh, let's figure that out here. CH4 has one carbon, four hydrogen. So carbon is 12.01. Hydrogen is 1.01, technically somewhere in that neighborhood. So four of them added together. One mole of methane weighs 16.04 uh, grams. Then we have to figure out our uh, mole ratio. So I have 1.2 times 10 to the 21. Uh, out of 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, that gives me a number that I multiply my 16 by to give me um, 0 0.0320 grams of methane. So um, practice, practice, practice. All right, little pause uh, from that headache. It's not getting any worse uh, from this point on, really. Uh, the next section here we're going to talk about is ideal gas calculations. Um, this specifically talks to, uh, you know, chemistry related to calculations that you may have to do when dealing with a gas analyzer, for example. Uh, not, uh, not anything mind-blowing here, hopefully. Okay, calculate the volume for a given number of moles of any gas at standard conditions. So one objective here. Uh, and it's and it's really not not bad. A couple steps at most. Okay, let's talk about gas uh, for a minute or two here. Um, gas is one of the three states of matter. Uh, if you've forgotten, uh, along with liquids and solids, uh, there is actually plasma, but we don't talk about it. Uh, gas has no specific shape, meaning that it takes the shape and volume of its container. If we remove the container, uh, it just expands openly and decreases in density until it's uh, at equilibrium, no big deal. Uh, gas has a low density uh, relative to liquids and solids. Uh, we know that because gases are always lighter than liquids and solids. Uh, and gases can expand to unlimited volumes, and the greater they expand, the more their density decreases. We'll talk about the kinetic theory of gases, which explains that gas pressure and molecular activity change with temperature. And we've talked about uh, vapor pressure, and this relates specifically to vapor pressure. Um, think of a jerry can on a hot day. I've used the same example before when we were talking about uh, vapor pressure. When the, when the molecules are warm, they are more active, as you see here, and they're bouncing off the sides of the container wall. They're banging on it, and that's what creates that pressure. Uh, as it cools off, the uh, atoms slow down, and they exert less pressure. Uh, this is all relative to temperature, and this is... Uh, works on, on this works on what we call ideal gases and lucky for us we're focusing mostly on ideal gases uh, as we move forward. Calling a gas an ideal gas makes some assumptions especially in the context of our ILM. First uh, gas particles are very small and move about in an empty space as we saw in the previous picture. Gas particles are not attracted to each other. Gas particles are always in motion crashing about within their container. They do not lose energy when they collide with each other, and the average kinetic energy is proportional to the gas's absolute temperature. This is all wonderful stuff. Science, hooray for science, it's a fact. Uh, the one that means the most to us is this final point here. The average kinetic energy is proportional to the gas's absolute temperature in Kelvin, basically saying is temperature goes up, kinetic energy goes up, and as temperature goes down, kinetic energy goes down, but it goes down relative to Kelvin. Remember this because it makes a difference. We will be using this in 
uh, something called the ideal gas law calculation. Uh, and here's the formula that we use for the ideal gas law, uh, gas law which is PV equals NRT, or some combobulation of this formula uh, is what's coming for us in the future here. Okay, P is the absolute gas pressure, V is the volume, N is the number of moles, R is the ideal gas constant, and don't worry about this number, it'll be given to you in a question, and T is the absolute, absolute temperature, meaning it's in Kelvin, so if given in Celsius, you'll have to add on your 273.15. So the ideal gas law calculation or equation lays out two things for us. First, Avogadro's law, which states that two identical gases at the same temperature, pressure, and volume will have the same number of particles. Fact. Number two, a volume of 22.4 liters of gas contains one mole or Avogadro's number of particles when at STP. So this number is key moving forward as it is Avogadro's number there that we've been using previously. Okay, standard temperature and pressure for us, uh, 273.15 at zero degrees and one atmosphere or 101.325 kPa as we move forward. So let's look at uh, what the heck's going on here. Let's let's look at uh, some of this math here. Where are we going? Oh my. Okay. So again, here's the here's the formula. Here's the different variations of this formula that you may have to use. This, I got this in here just because it's a nice handy dandy little cheat sheet. Um, I was never really good going back and forth between formulas before. Uh, so I kind of throw this in there as a sympathy thing. I've gotten better at it as I got older, but uh, when I was younger, I didn't like doing this. Uh, so I got that out here. So uh, molar volume, uh, something that we're going to be talking about next. The volume at which contains one mole of gas at a certain temperature and pressure. And we already said uh, 22.4 liters uh, is one mole at standard temperature and pressure. If any of those variables change, we have to use this formula, and that's where we're going. Okay, molar volume. Calculating the molar volume, we can convert many ways. Uh, to convert the volume of the gas to moles and back, we do this. So if we have moles uh, of atoms and we want to convert it to volume, we multiply by 22.4. If we have some kind of volume and we want to find the moles or the number of atoms, we divide by 22.4. So this map, I think you'll find pleasantly simpler. Convert one half of mole, uh, one half of a mole of helium at standard temperature and pressure into liters. And it says use the chart. I don't know where the heck this chart is uh, exactly. But if we know that one mole of any gas at standard temperature and pressure is 22.4 liters, and I have half a mole of it, math is simple 0.5 times 22.4 is 11.2 liters. Nothing more than that. If I have 37 liters of helium at standard temperature and pressure. How many moles do I have? Well, I know that one mole is 22.4 liters. So let's divide 37 by 22.4 and we get 1.65 moles based on that math. So not tricky, hopefully. Okay, so simple Simon, uh, use its volume to find the number of moles. Multiply the number of moles by its molar mass in order to find the mass of a particular volume. That's what we're doing next here. So just one more step. Find the mass of 12.7 liters of chlorine gas. Well, first we have to know how much does chlorine gas weigh. Two molecules or two atoms of chlorine, Cl, uh, has an atomic number of, uh, sorry, atomic mass of 35.45 grams. There's two of them, so two times that is 70.9 grams per mole. If I had 22.4 liters, that's how much it would weigh. But I don't. I have 12.7 liters. So 12.7 out of 22.4 is 0.567 moles. 0.567 moles times 70.9 grams is 40.2 grams. So that's the mass of chlorine gas in 12.7 liters. So again, math is not particularly hard. It's the steps that you have to be uh, taking to get there. And again, with practice, 
uh, it'll become easier and easier, but there is no excuse for not being able to just fumble around and fill in the blanks. Okay, so here's our super chart. This is everything that we've looked at starting from page two um, all the way all the way to now, just as a review. Um, I'm not, I think this is in the ILM also. Uh, next slide here is going to deal with gas density. Uh, again, the math itself, uh, not horribly bad. Only a few variables to consider. Uh, we can also use the molar volume to calculate the gas density. Uh, gas density is measured in grams per liter. So this is what we're going to be ultimately doing, finding out how many grams per liter. So we're going to calculate the gas density at SDP by dividing the molar mass, that's the grams per mole, by the volume, which is liters per mole. Okay, so the ILM, again, lays it out in this wonderful linear type of formula. I don't like that. I kind of tend to do it in my head, but do whatever you want to do. What is the density of oxygen at standard temperature and pressure? Well, oxygen, two atoms of oxygen is two times 16 or 32 grams for every mole. One mole of any gas is 22.4 liters. So 32 grams divided by 22.4 liters is 1.43 grams per liter. That's standard temperature and pressure. Very straightforward. I find this to be more confusing than it needs to be. Suit yourself on whichever way you like to do it. Okay, working through some examples from the ILM here just to make sure all our viewers are following along here. How many moles does 10 liters of an ideal gas at STP contain? Well, one mole is 22 liters. I have 10 liters, so it's going to be less than a mole. Let's see. 10 liters out of 22.4 is 0.466. So, sure, less than half a mole. What volume of any ideal gas does 1.5 moles of gas at STP contain? Well, one mole is 22.4 liters. Two moles would be 44.8. So somewhere between those two numbers, 1.5 times 22 is 33.6. So not, uh, not brain-busting math. Okay, what is the mass of 10.2 liters of helium at standard temperature and pressure? So let's look at the helium gas. Mass of helium uh, is 4.03 grams per mole. I have 10 liters of it, so that's not even a whole mole. That's less than half a mole, so I'm going to have less than 4 grams. Let's do the math here. 10.2 uh, liters out of 22.4 liters gives us the number of moles, uh, which is somewhere under 0.5. Uh, we multiply that number under 0.5 times 4, gives us a number under 2, or in this case, 1.82 grams. So again, you can do it this way if you like, or you can uh, do it another way. But you, uh, you can get a pretty good idea just running it through in your head. Okay, what is the density of argon at standard temperature and pressure? So argon's molar mass off the periodic table is 39.995 grams per mole. And if I put that 39.995 grams per mole into a mole molar volume of a gas, which is always at standard temperature and pressure, 22.4 liters, 39.95 divided by 22.4 is going to give us 1.78 grams for every liter. So same thing, more complicated. I don't know. It's just me. Am I making too big of a deal out of that? Okay, so that's the tricky part. Uh, we're into the last section of this ILM. Uh, this is easy math. This math does uh, rear its head uh, in other subjects. So um, make sure that you can do it because uh, it will definitely come and haunt you in the future. Okay, what we're going to do next is something called percent mass composition calculations. Uh, and it's not really very complicated here. Uh, each element in a compound, as we learn, makes up a percentage of that compound based on the formula unit ratio. The percent mass composition is that percentage of each individual element by that molar ratio. 
So again, if we looked at our uh, formula here, uh, one mole of this compound contains six parts carbon, 12 hydrogen, and six parts oxygen. We can take the molar masses of each of these individual elements and break them out. So six times uh, 12 is 72 grams, 12 times one is 12 grams, and six times 16 is 96 grams. Add these up, and that's 180 grams. One mole of this compound weighs 180 grams. Now I want to find out what the percent mass composition is. And all that is, is what is the percentage of this that is contributed by each of the different elements. So the math is simple. 72 grams out of the 180 is carbon. 12 grams out of the 180 is hydrogen. And 96 grams out of the 180 is oxygen. So we're just going to do that division. So 12 out of 180 times 100 to turn it into a percent equals 40%. Um, 12, what the heck is this? This is a mess, this is messed up math, but whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, this should have been 72 out of 180 times 100. Uh, this should be 12 out of 180 times 100. And this should be uh, 96 out of 180 times 100. And that gives us our percentages. These are the numbers that we're, that we're after. When we sum them all up, they should be pretty darn close to 100. So that's the process. Uh, it's not too tricky. I'm not sure what uh, what's going on here, why I snipped this out. This is kind of dirty. Um, but you got to remember, six times the atomic uh, mass for each, uh, each portion of it. Okay, let's look at a better example here. I think this one's out of the ILM. Total molar mass of C2H5Cl is 64.51 grams per mole. So nice of them to give it to us. Calculate each element's mass percentage as follows. So in this, two parts carbon, five parts hydrogen, one part chlorine. So two times carbon or two times 12 out of the 65. Five times hydrogen, five times one out of the 65. One part chlorine, so one times 35 out of the 65 gives us a number. We multiply that number by 100 and it turns it into a percent. So in this compound, 37.23 is carbon, 7.81 is hydrogen, and 54.95% is chlorine. So that is, uh, that's how you do that. It's not, um, that's probably the easiest math today. Okay, let's make sure we're good at this. Calculate the percent mass composition of iron three nitrate using figure 17 to find out each element's atomic mass. Figure 17 is just a periodic table. Uh, express these as molar masses in grams per mole, which is pretty much what we've moved to uh, anyway. So iron, periodic table says 55.85. Nitrogen, 14.01. Oxygen is 16. And all we have to do is apply our ratio. So in this compound, there's one iron, and there's three of everything inside this bracket. So three times nitrogen means three nitrogens, and three times O3 means nine oxygens. So you gotta make sure you get that calculated properly. So adding these all together, one, one times iron is 55, uh, three times 14 is 42, and nine times 16 is 100 and something, blah, blah, blah. Add them all together, uh, one formula of Iron 3 nitrate weighs 241.88 grams per mole. Now we've got to figure out what each uh, element's contribution is to that total mass there. So 1 times 55 out of 241 times 100% tells us that we're 23% iron. 3 times 14 out of 241 times 100 tells us we're 17% nitrogen. And 9 times 16 out of 241 times 100 tells us we're about 60% oxygen. So hopefully that's uh, a nice way to end up the ILM. That's the end of the calculations for today uh, and the end of chemical calculations part A. Fenito.